When a life is threatened, each heartbeat and every second is precious. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of efforts to triumph over tragedy on Rescue 911. We begin on the afternoon of May 4th, 1990, in the small town of Plainfield, Indiana, as Tim Mongan was driving home along a rain-soaked stretch of country road. I was driving fairly slow, and it seemed like the, this car approaching me wasn't going very fast either. Suddenly, it hydroplaned and uh, managed to spin wildly uh, side over side uh, off into the woods. And uh, I was trying to realize whether what I thought I saw, I actually saw. It was so unbelievable. I didn't see mashed down weeds. Uh, trees bent over. I didn't. I couldn't see a thing. It was just like uh, the woods had never been penetrated. As soon as I realized that I'd seen an accident, and uh, I couldn't imagine that there wouldn't be major injuries, I drove to the nearest house. I was worried that uh, people inside would open the door, even because I must have looked like a swamp monster or something. But uh, nobody answered the door. Tim ran from house to house looking for help. I was beginning to be worried that I couldn't even find the accident because I lost my orientation, turning my truck around, going up driveways, going down the road. I was uh, really approaching desperation. And then finally, fortunately, at about the fourth house, uh, a man was home. Tom Horner was home for lunch. He just said that he'd witnessed an accident. You know, I was real surprised because I couldn't, couldn't see anything. And normally, there's, if there's an accident out around this area, you can see a lot of evidence of it. Nobody in the neighborhood's been hurt. But Tim was persistent. He insisted he had seen a car go off the road. At that time, I knew that he was serious. So I went in and called the sheriff's department and told them that there had been a, a serious accident. At the time, it seemed like eternity and that perhaps I should be at the accident scene. I was going to walk along and see if I couldn't pinpoint where the accident had taken place. I noticed a girl out on the road, and I suddenly realized that she had been in this accident. Oh, God, can you walk okay? Uh, she was delirious. She had bumped her head, obviously, and I was amazed that she could walk. Is she all right? She's hurt. Is there anybody else with her? She said she was alone. I didn't know whether she was dying or, or what. We knew she was in a lot of pain, and we both thought that we needed to get her in the house. When an unidentified young woman was found wandering by the side of a road, bloody and disoriented from an apparent car accident, two strangers came to her aid. While Tim Mongan treated her, Tom Horner placed a call for help. Tom's second call for help came in at 12.13 p.m. Emergency? Yes. Where's the location? Uh, just south of 800S on 267, old 267. Okay, is this the auto accident? Yes, it is, and there's a person hurt, and they're in my house right now. And you have the person The in person the house. has come up to the house, and they're injured, and they need an ambulance. Is there anyone else in the car? No one else is in the car. Was one car involved only? Yes. And your name? We'll have the ambulance come to your home. They are on their way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Build engine one, ambulance one, squad one, and medic one. An auto accident. Plainfield Fire Rescue Units were dispatched to the scene. Through the sheriff's second hand, original fire advised that the car is off the road, inverted into the woods area. I ran out the front door, and so I would be out there to direct them to the house since it's not a real easy house to find. The first rescue units arrived within seven minutes. Advanced EMT Jim Adams and his partner immediately went to treat the victim. 17-year-old Mary Joelle Stewart could remember very little except her name. Mary Jo? Mary Jo, can you hear me? My partner, Mike Hillebrand, started doing a good survey of the patient and that's when we realized that hey this lady really took a hard knock she's she's not totally with it she's missing something here she didn't know what happened to herself we asked her how their clothes get wet she didn't have the faintest idea 
Firefighter Wayne Long began searching for her car. As we drove down there, we were looking off into the woods to see if we could see an automobile. When I went down to the, to the creek bank and looked down, I saw the car. It was just an amazing fact that there was no trace of the car going off the road. The top was smashed clear down to the top of the windows, and I don't see how anyone survived getting out of that car. Am I in there? I don't think so. Wayne and his partner headed for the ravine to inspect the wreck. You know, our job is to make sure there's nobody else in the car and make sure the car's not creating a hazard. Mary Jo? It's real common for most accident people to uh, don't even remember what happened in the accident. Not at all? You just keep asking the same questions, and you can pick up on these questions. Mary Jo, do you have any medical history I should know about? None? You've had a baby? You've had a baby? Yeah. Three months ago. Okay, where's he at now? He advised on a second victim. When we got the questionnaire and come to the conclusion that possibly it was an infant, I radioed my captain. Guys, go ahead and assume you got a second victim. Wayne managed to get his head and shoulders inside the wreck. I found a diaper bag with a bottle with some formula still in it. I saw a car seat. It was latched, but there was no child in it. It was just an overwhelming feeling of horror when I felt something in the water. I grabbed a hold of something that I thought was a leg, and all I had was this toy in my hand. And Jay said that we better find him quick because there was a larger waterway down there, and if the child got in the waterway, we would never be able to find him. The water was muddy, and you couldn't see the bottom, so I was just slowly running my foot along underneath the car doing a search for the infant, but I didn't find anything. Was it a boy or a girl? Jim and Mike continue to question Mary Joelle about her three-month-old baby. Philip? Okay, where is Philip now? You have any idea? It's important. That's your grandmother's house. Well, I asked her at that time if she knew what her grandmother's phone number was. Mary Jo, that's not the right number. Can you give me another number? She gave me a phone number that was just totally off the wall. I asked her to repeat the phone number, and she just gave me the last four numbers of her grandmother's phone number. Is that 839 or 831? Hello? Yes, this is Plainfield Fire Department. I asked her if she knew anybody by name of Philip. I said, yes, Philip's her grandson. I said, is Philip with you? She says, no, Mary Jo picked him up a few minutes ago. And I said, thank you, and hung up. I needed to get a hold of my captain and let him know that there was a second patient. Jay, it's confirmed. She had a three-month-old baby with her. Yes. Down there, is that a doll? Where? Down there. Is that the doll or the baby? That's the baby. Go. Come on, you guys. Go on down here. Jay and I both knew that we had to get to the child fast before it got washed into a larger stream. Because the water was moving so fast, you pick your leg up and then kind of want to sweep your leg out from under it. He was partially submerged. The skin looked waxy, and uh, he didn't have the normal flush tone that you would normally see in a child. I didn't really think he was real until I actually touched him. Come on, Jay, give me some help. Every time I'd try to reach him up to Lester, I would slide back down the bank. And Jay come up behind me and held me up on the creek bank high enough that I could hand him up to Lester. It had been nearly 35 minutes since the accident. Baby Philip was showing no signs of life, and no one knew how long he'd been underwater. We turned him on his side and got as much of the water out as we could that way, and then I started giving him ventilation. Keep doing CPR, don't stop. Greg had me continue doing CPR while he set up his equipment to innovate the baby. Doing CPR on infants like, like your worst nightmare. If you press too hard, you can cause them injury, or if you breathe too hard into their lungs, you can cause injury. Paramedic Greg Livingston intubated the baby while Wayne continued chest compressions. But there was still no pulse. Like I say, he'd been in there for at least 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and I just thought, this child really didn't have a chance. We moved the patient over to a backboard and proceeded to move him to the ambulance. You lead, Dan, you lead. You got one step there. Mary Joelle and her baby were transported to the nearest hospital in separate ambulances. But Philip still was not breathing and had no heartbeat. I'm going to get the diaper off and I'm going to wipe it down. 
I put a lead on the baby, and Jade said, well, you, you pulled on his chest a little hard. And I said, I didn't pull on his chest very hard. That was the baby. And the more he tried to breathe, the better his pulse got. And I, I know I had a grin on his face, and I looked at Jay, and he had a grin on his face, too. At the hospital, Mary Joel was treated for a severe head injury. Her little son was still in critical condition, under the care of Nurse Lillian Cundiff. We tried to get a temperature on the baby, and our thermometer wouldn't even register that low. I need to see if I've got a pulse. Philip, in fact, had a pulse. I did not feel like that his physical injuries were that serious. But my biggest concern was that he would be brain damaged because he'd been without oxygen for so long. Your baby, the doctor and the other nurses are with him. Mary Joel had suffered a concussion and a fractured sternum. She was released after three days. Her baby was transferred to a pediatric intensive care unit under the supervision of Dr. Howard Egan. The parents were, were always kept informed of the fact that this was a, a very tenuous situation. It was really touch and go from the very beginning. I really, I couldn't stand sitting there watching him because it looked, you know, it looked like he was helpless and I was helpless because I couldn't do anything. He was blue. He, he had tubes and... IVs all over him, and I mean, that I put him through that, and that just, it really hurts. I think it was the first time I ever seen my grandmother cry, but I never thought or doubted that he wouldn't make it. The best part to me was the day he cried. Just the sound, just to have him make a sound I could have listened to. I wish I'd have had it on tape. Advanced EMT Wayne Long visited baby Philip in the hospital. I think the real hero out of this is Phil, because we just we just got things started. He's the one that had to go through everything. When I went in to see him and all the nurses and everything said he's, he's doing great, he's going to live, it's just like one of my own family members. The coldness of the water that day helped Philip survive without any brain damage. Within three weeks, he had made a complete recovery. The stewards are now even more careful that Philip is securely fastened to his car seat. The paramedics saved Philip's life, and, I mean, you don't realize that until something like this has happened to your family, that people out there really do care. At first, I was worried, you know, I don't want him to be petrified of the water. And so, ever since I took him swimming the first time, I saw that he would like the water, and I think that maybe if I took him to a swim class, and if he learned young, then I think that would be best for him. The accident made me and my husband closer to realize that Philip was very special to us and he's brought a lot of happiness into our life and that the child just can't be replaced. 